The National Park Service uh, administers the National Park System, which consists of over 400 national park units of various designations and importantly sizes. And in the 1990s, it was recognized that the natural resources in the various units were not getting the attention they deserved. But for example, a, a national park unit established to um, preserve cultural resources can frequently also harbor rare ecosystems and species. And so it, uh, also uh, uh, the national parks uh, did not understand what long-term patterns might be happening with their uh, uh, natural resources. So in response, the uh, Inventory and Monitoring Division was created, whereby the system was divided into over 30 biological or ecological regions, and then all the parts within this would be uh, uh, monitored by a new office not under the management of an individual park. This had the advantage of being independent, and it had the disadvantage of uh, uh, some of the parks were afraid that it was just going to uh, take all the funding. Uh, so we are in the uh, Pacific Island uh, Network, uh, consisting of the national parks of the Hawaiian Islands, uh, War in the Pacific on Guam, American Memorial Park in Saipan, and uh, American Samoa. Uh, Angle and pools that we monitor occur in Kalokohona Pahau, which we just saw, Pu'u Ohonawa Ohonana, which we've also heard about uh, during the, the, the conference, and the Alkahakai National Historic Trail, which uh, doesn't have its own land, the portions of the trail occur in various areas, but it allows us to have access to basically almost the entire coast on the, uh, on the west side uh, with which the sample pools. Now, uh, the uh, Pacific Island Network, or PACAN, organizes its work under protocols. Uh, so we do a, a lot of a different work in a variety of ecosystems. And ankle and pools are monitored under the water quality and a new ankle and pool protocol, which was only recently uh, approved. Uh, for example, here is uh, Kalokohon Kahau, and this is a false color image uh, showing vegetation <laughs> in uh, pink. And, and as has been already uh, illustrated, there are different populations of pools in different areas. Now, the protocols were originally designed for the purpose of characterizing a, an ecosystem type within the unit of the park. Now, like political boundaries, the boundaries of a national park are essentially arbitrary with respect to ecological conditions. So the question then becomes, if we have this artificial boundary uh, around these ecosystems, what's the correct way to sample? Uh, so originally, what was chosen about 14, 15 years ago, was a split panel design, whereby we would have a panel of four sites that, for example, for water quality, uh, four sites that we would we would sample every quarter, and then four sites that were ra uh, generated randomly from a known population of sites. So we have four fixed sites, and then four randomly generated temporary sites. Now. Uh, Humans like to classify things, and we like to identify things that are obvious. So we say ankle and pools, because that's an obvious thing that we can see on the landscape. As we're emphasizing during the, the, the symposium, that these are windows into a, a, a larger world, right? Uh, so does choosing an individual pond or pool make sense with respect to long-term monitoring of this ecosystem? What is the ecosystem? Is it the entire population of pools on the coast? Is it within a, a rift as defined by the, the genetics of the, of, the, uh, uh, of the shrimp? Is it uh, an ahuapa? Uh, I'm not mispronouncing that. Um, and, uh, or is it a, a more of a localized region of pools uh, that is sharing some kind of hydrology? Or is it, you know, in, to some degree, all of this in some kind of a nested hierarchy? So uh, our long-term water quality monitoring data looks like this. And uh, already what we've been learning is, of course, there are subpopulations of pools within even an artificial boundary um, of a national park. And so uh, as was pointed out yesterday by Ann Ferrari and uh, Amanda McCutcheon, uh, for example, in Caho, we have localized populations of pools which behave more closely with each other than they do with others that are further uh, apart. 
from each other. So for example, we have uh, north, uh, pools that are north of the Coloco uh, uh, fish pond. Uh, and uh, if we look at, at, at uh, total dissolved nitrogen, for example, we, we'll see this peak that we do not see in central pools, and we also do not see in pools that are north of the harbor, uh, to, which borders onto the, uh, of the south, the southern end of the of the park. We also see, for example, the the just the general uh, concentrations are different in in different regions of the park. Uh, uh, this you know is. is empirical justification that that uh, there are subpopulations of pools and that they are subject to uh, fluctuations that, that are caused by not just, for example, landscape features, which they are, but also land use. And thus, if we start to think about the classic uh, image of what is an ecosystem and can we define it by an n-dimensional hypervolume, uh, we have to add, and as we are learning in, in this symposium today, about, a host of new uh, uh, dimensions, one of which we, which we haven't really talked about yet, is land use. Now, Coloco is unique uh, among the parks in the Pacific here, uh, the national parks, in that it is really heavily influenced by uh, land use and development, especially in the last 20 years. So we, we, we asked, for example, what caused the spike in nitrogen? And uh, well, it happens to correspond with the creation of a golf course immediately north of the park. And so thus it shouldn't be surprising. They lay down sod, uh, they're watering it, they're probably fertilizing it at the same time. They're flushing material into the groundwater, it's percolating into the park, and then out to sea. And again, we don't see this in other parts of the, uh, uh, of the park. So, what are we doing this for? The primary purpose of this monitoring is to provide information to the natural resource management divisions of these parks so that they can make better natural resource management, uh, educated man, uh, management decisions. And this, this uh, comes in the form of long-term trends and or acute uh, 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 events that we might record. And this helps to underscore uh, the importance of long-term monitoring uh, in the larger scientific discourse, including uh, and per perhaps even especially with regard to historically understudied ecosystems like the Anglo Pool. So, for example, this is this is a great example of an acute event. We know that uh, the changes in land use can cause changes inside the park. We see long-term trends, for example, in the central. Uh, uh, pools where we have an increase in phosphorus and then it, it kind of leveled out. And then what about these low concentrations in these pools? Well, these are pools that are, are essentially on a, a, a peninsula and thus surrounded on three sides by the ocean so we're having much more uh, influence by uh, uh, marine waters as opposed to, to, to fresh waters. Uh, so in addition to the primary purpose of, of, of giving data to the parks that they can use to help guide their management decisions, we also have the opportunity to study these ecosystems and, and gain insight in a way that's different than hypothesis-driven research. Uh, a, a third uh, use of the data is to improve our monitoring uh, itself. And the, the intention is about every 10 years, publish a trend report and we examine our data and then take a critical look at our methodology. So uh, examining this data shows that the split panel design is probably not the best way of sampling this, and we should be doing some kind of a stratified sampling that treats subpopulations of, of as populations that we should probably uh, uh, sample probabilistically. Uh, we also have a brand new protocol that was uh, approved in 2018. We implemented it for the first time in 2019, put it on hold for the pandemic, and we've started to, uh, we're going to be implementing it at least in part this year, this month, although we're starting to run into permit issues. Uh, and that's an, a, a protocol for the purpose of, of monitoring uh, primarily uh, uh, animal populations. We're doing this in Coloco with a smaller number of uh, sites than we do for water quality, and then three sites in 
Puho, this is at their Royal Grounds, and then uh, this is the Green Waste Pool, which we saw yesterday. Uh, and this is, this is a much more limited than a water quality protocol, but again, we're, we're limited by uh, personnel and resources. The primary focus, as I mentioned, is uh, population trends over time for crustaceans and mollusks, including the, the endangered uh, damsel fly. But uh, because we're going to be out there anyway, we have the opportunity to try to also examine basic ecosystem features for the purpose of trying to you know, better understand the nature of the ecosystems uh, that we're studying here, or that we're monitoring here. So for example, we, we want to know about the uh, species uh, and percent cover of, of riparian vegetation, its general configuration and geomorphology. I'm interested in the light regime, and by that I mean not how much light might be hitting the angle and pull on any given day, but given its geomorphology and orientation and, and, and potential canopy cover, preparing vegetation, that sort of thing, how much light does it generally receive uh, uh, over the year? And then we're, we're, we can also relate this to the water quality protocol. Many of the sites are co-located with the water quality protocol. And we've uh, added water quality sampling at both high and low tide with respect to the equal pool uh, protocol, whereas water quality protocol is basically almost always at low tide. So it's, uh, it's the second day. It's at the end of the day. Let's look at some pictures just to get an idea of the variety of pools that uh, we examine and the, the amazing variety of pools that exist in such a small area. So this is uh, one of the, uh, this is one of our uh, angling pool sites here. You can see fish traps, and we also have an, uh, 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 shrimp traps. Well, uh, we're trying to, this of course is very difficult. How do you enumerate the, 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 uh, the shrimp? We've been, you know, gone around and around this kind of thing, and we're doing both visual time surveys using quadrats and trapping. Uh, we'd like to uh, maybe do trapping, deploy traps overnight also. Depends on, on what, what the uh, Fish and Wildlife Service has to say about that. But this is a pool uh, uh, near where we just saw um, uh, uh, some of the damselfly pools uh, are located. A young uh, uh, a lava field, open canopy, but also, you know, you can already see that it, it, it does get shade, so this affects the light ratio that I'm interested in. Another uh, pool, a little larger this time, but again in a uh, young open lava field. Uh, both of these are in color of the Hanukkah house. This is the green waste pool, which we saw yesterday in Puuhonua, uh, and it's been protected by a, a, uh, um, a fence, but all of this fine sediment here is very organic and nutrient rich, which it's probably uh, thanks to the pigs that were using it as a wallow. I believe this pool is literally, every time it rains, I think it's like flushing nutrients into the aquifer. And we can, I think we can detect this in another pool that's very close by. So I think that, you know, we need to scoop this out and restore it. Uh, even then with all of this uh, fine sediment, we still get shrimp in there. Uh, we have, uh, this is one of the pools on that, uh, uh, a peninsula uh, at the southern end of the park. Uh, it's uh, filled with a, a naturally occurring algae, which of course makes enumeration of the shrimp that much more difficult because now we have an additional third dimensional uh, matrix with which to try to sample it. Uh, this is that pool that uh, Robert just described that had the uh, inundation of fine sediments in 2011. So we, here we have a variety of substrate types in this pool. But again, largely open and without a whole lot of uh, shading or uh, uh, timing. And I got one minute left, so we got another pool. And uh, this is another pool in Puho. Again, fine sediments caused by invasive species, mainly tilapia. And lastly, uh, another pool at um, Puho. This is part of the rail grounds. Completely open, uh, very little shading at all. Uh, I probably don't have time for questions, but. And one last thing I'd like to say is that, you know, excuse me, the fundamental <laughs> basis of all science is observation. And monitoring provides data which is very complementary to everyone's uh, hypothesis driven work. Uh, I'd like to be, I'd, I'd like to uh, 
increase our, our uh, collaboration with everyone that is working in these uh, amazing ecosystems. So if I haven't already talked to you about that, please uh, uh, come and talk to me afterwards. Thank you. Thank you.